Reimagine commercial banking possibilities by partnering with us. Reimagine it. Welcome to Banking Reimagined. Hello, Moto. It's time to reimagine the smartphone. G Suite can help reimagine work for enterprise companies like yours. Healing Reimagined. We're reimagining a whole new world of possibilities. Hey everybody, welcome to Christ Community Chapel. Uh, glad you're here. I welcome those of you over in East Hall, those of you who are tuning in. Uh, welcome. Those of you who are out there and are, don't feel comfortable coming back yet, I want you to know we're going to be like uh, Motel 6. We will leave the light on for you. And we will just wait for you because we, uh, we miss you and uh, long for you to come back. All right, another big Sunday. And you know how you can tell. Another new sports coach. Uh, not really. Uh, it's almost new. I can't afford any more new sport coats. So uh, I'm glad that this is the last of our three-part series that we are calling Reimagine. Uh, and listen, if you are a visitor here for the first time, or if you've been coming for 30 years, we want you to hear all three of these messages. So if you missed one of the other messages, please get on our website, listen, get on our app, and watch or catch up, because we want you to be on the same page. All right? This series is intended to be like an hors d'oeuvre, uh, just to whet your appetite. The real meal is what we call our reimagined class. And if you're here and you're thinking, uh, man, I'm ready. I, I love what I'm hearing. I'm pumped. This is great. You are an early adopter, and we have a class for you. I think our October class is completely filled now, but we have a November class that we opened up that you can sign up for in the Next Step area, which would be great if you are an early adopter. If you're here and you are a person that's saying, I'm just trying to process this, I need some time, you are who we had in mind when we decided to roll it out like this. Because this three-week series is really just a view from 10,000 feet. And then next week, I will introduce a 10-week series on the book of Acts, where we will look at the rhythm of the early church. Because the early church actually changed the world, and part of that secret was their rhythm and we want to emulate that as closely as possible. Then we'll go into Advent and celebrate the birth of our Savior. And then in January of 2021, I will give a four-week vision series like I normally do at the beginning of each year. But instead of introducing a theme that will carry us through one year, I'll be introducing a theme that we hope will carry us for 30 years. All right? Let's reimagine. I told you the last couple of weeks that about 18 months ago, we tried to take a step back from all the busyness that was going on at our church and ask some questions. And the most important questions we asked were the questions we asked Jesus. And the questions we asked Jesus is, it was this, is this what you want? Is this what you had in mind? Are we doing things you don't want us to do as a church? Are we not doing things that you want us to do as a church? And that took us to prayer and then to the Bible. And we ended up in Matthew chapter 28. At the end of the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus has already died on the cross. He is resurrected. He's about to ascend to heaven to get his, in his rightful place at the right hand of the throne of God. But before he ascends, he calls his disciples together one last time. And he gives them their marching orders, their final command, their mandate. And this is what he tells them. This is Matthew chapter 28, beginning at verse 16. It says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is God's word, and it's true. All right? Jesus gives a final mandate to go and make disciples, and I told you last week that if you are a Christian today, it is at least in part because there has been an unbroken thread for 2,000 years of people who have obeyed 
that commandment. If you are a Christian today, it is at least in part due to an unbroken thread of people who for 2,000 years have been obeying the command of Jesus to go and make disciples. So first and foremost, we know that our church, Christ Community Chapel, has got to be about being a part of that unbroken thread. That's what we want. And we want you to be a part of that unbroken thread as well. One of the things that I love about the passage that I just read was uh, verse 17, where it says that some of the disciples saw him and worshiped and others doubted. I like that, that some of them doubted because some of them didn't feel adequate, didn't feel ready, but Jesus thought they were. And the reason that Jesus believed that the disciples were ready to go ahead and go make disciples was because of what he says in verse 20. And in verse 20, Jesus says, I will be with you. I will be with you. Is there anything you cannot do if Jesus is with you? Is there anything we as a church cannot do if Jesus is with us? All right? Last couple of weeks, we've been talking about a disciple, and we have described a disciple using four geometric shapes and four words. The four geometric shapes are square, triangle, triangle, square. And the four words are ought, is, hope, and ideal. And what we said is that every single person goes through this process or is involved in these four geometric shapes and these four words. Because these four words not only describe the overarching theme of the Bible, but it also describes the plight of all of humanity. That every single person that you know, and including yourself, know deep down that the world as it is, is not what it ought to be. You can feel that, you know that. You also know that deep down, you as you are, are not what you ought to be. And every single person is trying to find hope, some way to become what they know they were intended to be, some way to change our world back into the ideal that they know deep down it should be. And here at Christ Community Chapel, we believe that the true hope for every human being is Jesus. That the only hope that you and I have to actually heal the brokenness inside of us that has impacted every area of our life is Jesus. The only hope for our community is Jesus. The only hope for the brokenness of our world is Jesus. That's what reimagined means. And one of the things that I want you to know is that reimagine is not a radically new vision for Christ Community Chapel. Jesus has always been central to us. We feel like it's a refocusing of a vision based on where God has brought us now. You know, I, I was thinking of the, the story of Esther. If you don't know the story of Esther, Esther was a young Jewish woman who won a beauty contest and that landed her in the palace of the most powerful king in the world. And she became the queen. And then there was a man named Haman who uh, kind of hatched this idea for a holocaust to kill all the Jewish people in the world. Now, Esther was an orphan who had been raised by a relative named Mordecai. And Mordecai sent her word about the holocaust and said, you got to do something to stop it. And Esther said, I, I don't know what to do. I don't know. I don't think I can. And then Mordecai says, this is the most famous part of that book and that story of Esther. Mordecai sends her a message and he says, but Esther, who knows, but for such a time as this. And what Mordecai was saying is that God has been orchestrating your life, all of your life to get you to this particular moment to do something with him and for him. And then Mordecai adds this. He says, make, make no mistake, Esther, God will save who he wants to save with or without you. But he is offering you this chance to participate in his great work. That's what we feel is happening here. That for 39 years in our church's history, God has been orchestrating, putting things together for such a time as this. He's been doing it in your life. He does it in mine. That's the way God always works. But we feel like we are at the place right now where we can attempt some great things with God and for God. 
And the three great goals that we have, looking back on the last 39 years, as we look forward to the next 30 years, is we want in the next 30 years, everyone, every community, everywhere. Those are our three goals. Everyone, every community, everywhere. Two weeks ago, I talked about everyone. What our goal is, is by the year 2050, 30 years, we want everyone within a 10-mile radius of this church to have a Jesus-following friend. We want every person, every one of your neighbors, every one of your associates, everyone within a 10-mile radius of this church to have a Jesus-following friend. We believe that means that we need to help 10,000 more people find their hope in Jesus in order for everyone to have a Jesus-following friend. But it seems like that's all God needs. You know, in the the book of Matthew, in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, Jesus has that iconic statement where he says, you are the salt of of the earth. You don't need a lot of salt to have an impact on something, but the salt has to get out of the salt shaker, right? And when I say that that's all God needs, the reason is that all God needs is someone to have a Jesus-following friend is that people are constantly experiencing disappointment. They're experiencing some disappointment in what they put their hope in that would actually give them the ideal life. Some people thought that a a certain promotion, that the the corner office would do it for them. And then they finally get in that corner office and they realize that it hasn't done what they thought it would do. And they're experiencing disappointment. Some some people experience it with their marriage. And I always think of that movie, Jerry Maguire, where Tom Cruise is looking at Renee Zellweger at the end of the movie. And he says, you, you know, complete me. I I don't know if he does that or not. But he says, you complete me. Everybody swoons, right? What's ironic is that Tom Cruise in real life has never been able to make a marriage work for him. So he's got to be disappointed. And anytime someone experiences disappointment in the hope that they had, it's an opportunity for them to find the real hope in Jesus. And all they need at that moment is a Jesus-following friend who will introduce them. And that could be you. And that could be me. That's everyone. The second great goal we have is every community. We have a goal that by the year 2050 and 30 years, that every community in Northeast Ohio would have a gospel preaching church. And we feel like our part will be to plant 60 churches in the next 30 years, actually 58 churches. Because last week, Wingfoot Church in Goodyear Heights opened their doors for the first time. They had 88 people last week. Right? And then uh, you can go ahead and clap for that. That's awesome. And then Story Church in Mayfield Heights opened their doors for the first time. They had 50 people, which is, again, amazing. Here's a little tidbit for you. Yeah, thanks. Here's a little tidbit. Uh, This church was started by around 40 people. This church was started with 40. Can you imagine what it would be like if either one of those churches ended up to be this church in 30 years, and that they, are, they begin to dream about planting 60 churches in the next 30 years. Unbroken thread. Unbroken thread. So I want you to know that a church planner is an extraordinary person. It takes an extraordinary person to plant a church. They need, we'll need everyone to participate if we're gonna plant 60 churches in 30 years. That means we will need to pray for them. We will need to give to support them. We'll need to go to be with them and help them. All right, that's the second goal. The third goal, and this is what I want to talk about today, is everywhere. Everywhere. We want to participate in God's mission to provide a gospel, a Christ-centered witness everywhere to everyone. All right, and I say it's God's mission because we know from the book of Revelation that that's what God wants to do because that's the end of the story. One of the great things about Christianity is we know how the story ends. And in Revelation chapter 7, we get a peek into heaven. And what's happening in heaven at that time is that Jesus is sitting on a throne and he's surrounded by a crowd of people that is so big that no one can number it. Those are all the people that have found their hope in Jesus. Right? And then John, who's writing the book of Revelation, he describes the crowd, and the way he describes the crowd is this, that there were people from every people and tongue and tribe and nation. 
from every people, tongue, tribe, and nation, which means that God desires, God will save people from every group and every ethnic group in the entire world. God can do that with or without us, but he may be inviting us to participate in that, and we want to do just that. And our part, we feel like, is to give $30 million in the next 30 years for global missions. $30 million. The reason we feel like we can bite off such a big chunk is because of that great theological truth that we learned from the movie Spider-Man, where, (laughs) that's true, Peter Parker was told with great power comes great responsibility. We believe with great resources comes great responsibility, and we have great resources here at Christ Community Chapel. And that really should excite us, and it should excite you for for a particular reason. In Matthew chapter 6, in the Sermon on the Mount, again, Jesus is talking about what to do with money, and this is what he says. This is Matthew chapter 6, beginning at verse 19. Jesus says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. Jesus is just giving some really sound financial investing uh, advice. He's saying when you're thinking about investing your money, think long-term, think safe investment, think great return. That's all he's saying. When you're thinking about where to put your money, think long-term, Safe investment, great return. And the thing that should really excite you is that he says, store up for yourself treasures in heaven. That means I can store up treasure for me. You can store up treasure for you. That means that something is in heaven that is going to benefit me in some way. The question is, what is that? I'm going to tell you, I think, what it is. I could be wrong here. I don't think so. I think I'm right. All right. But this is it. Whenever I think about giving to missions, I always think about, uh, it's like investing in a portfolio. It's like uh, buying a stock. Like if I buy Amazon stock, I don't actually work for Amazon. I don't deliver a package. I give that company my money. They use my money, and then I get to reap some benefit from their success as a company. I think that's the way mission works. I think one one of the most amazing times in heaven. Now, the the greatest moment in heaven will be when you see Jesus face to face. I mean, bar none. It will undo you. It will undo me. I can't wait. Because every, every bit of love that you've experienced in this life, every bit of joy will be like a single drop of water compared to Niagara Falls when you see him face to face. There are times when I, uh, just the goodness of Jesus makes me uh, choke up. And I know like this much about Jesus but one day I will see him face to face, and you will too, if you know him. So that's the most uh, amazing moment in heaven, but I think heaven will be filled with a lot of great moments. And one of the other great moments will be when someone comes up behind you, taps you on the shoulder, and you turn around and see a person, a person's face that you know you have never met from a country you have never visited. And there with tears in their eyes, they look at you and they just say, thank you, thank you. In part because of you, I found my hope in Jesus. And I just wanted to thank you. Can you imagine what that would be like? It's moments like that that will make heaven, heaven. I was in India several years ago on a mission trip. And uh, I was with India Gospel League, and they plant churches all over India and, and rural villages. And one of our translators uh, was uh, an old Indian man named Matthew. And I loved talking to Matthew, partly because he had a British accent, which just cracked me up. But I was uh, sitting with Matthew and talking to him. And I was asking him what he did when he was a young man. When he was a young man, he was a church planter. And the way that church planting works in rural India is that every village has a head man. And you're not allowed to go into that village without the approval of the head man. And so a a church planner would go and they would stand on the outskirts of the village and they would begin to preach until somebody took that message back to the headman and said, somebody's outside the village with a message he wants to come in. And then the headman will send a message and invite him in. 
and then he gets to preach in the village. And if enough people find their hope in Jesus, then they start a church. That's the way church planting works. And Matthew and I were talking, and he said, you know, up the road a little bit is a village. And I went there as a church planter when I was a young man. And he said, I rode my bicycle there, and I stood outside, and I preached until uh, the headman. But instead of the headman sending or coming out to invite me in, he sent three men, and they beat me. And they knocked me off my bicycle, and they beat me. And when they were through beating me, I said to them, I will be back tomorrow, and you can beat me again. And so he did, and they did. And then he came back the next day. And he preached again, and they sent the same three guys, and they beat him again. Until finally the head man decided, I'm going to go out and find out what message this guy has that he wants to tell so badly that he will endure these beatings. And then Matthew said with just a twinkle in his eye, he said, and you know what? There's a church in that village now. And that head man is a Christian. It takes an extraordinary person to be a church planter, right? And, and I'll tell you this, it costs $40 a month to support a church planter for the India Gospel League. Another $40 will buy them a bicycle so they don't have to walk to the outskirts of a village to begin to preach. They can actually ride a bike. This is something you might not know, you probably don't know. We're gonna try to get better at communicating stuff like this. But in 2017, we decided to agree with India Gospel League to be the financial backer to help them in a particular province. And the goal in five years is to plant 415 churches in, those, in that five-year span in a single province. They've already planted 158 churches. That means 158 times a church planter went to the outskirts of a village and began to preach until a headman invited them in. And then they preached there until people found their hope in Jesus. Then they started a church. Listen, this is what I want you to know, that if you have given money to Christ Community Chapel, that is in your portfolio. That is treasure. That is where there are going to be people in heaven who will tap you on your shoulder and say thank you. People you've never met from countries that you have never visited because of that. That's what we want to do. Right? And for us, our sweet spot for you know, $30 million is not all we're going to do for global missions, but it's quantifiable and it's something that we feel like we should quantify. But uh, one of the, our sweet spot for global missions is going to be indigenous church planting because that's what we're doing here in Northeast Ohio. And when I say indigenous, I mean using people who are from that country or from that area because they'll know the culture. Like for us here in Northeast Ohio, you know, we want our, our best church planters are probably going to be American because they understand American culture. Even better, somebody from the, mid, the Midwest because we are a particular kind of people. Even better, somebody from Northeast Ohio so we don't have to teach them how to be a Browns fan, right? So that's what we intend to do. So that would be our sweet spot to have somebody like India Gospel League with indigenous pastors, but we also want to participate in reaching unreached people because there are people who have nobody in their entire people group, their language, their ethnic group, who has found their hope in Jesus. So we need somebody who is a pioneer who will go there, and we want to participate in that because we know that that's God's mission according to Revelation 7. But then there's a third group. That's a, a group that has actually come here to us from all over the world. Bina Paisley uh, runs, a, she's a member here. She runs a ministry down in Akron called Crossings. It's a ministry that ministers to uh, immigrants and refugees who have found their way here. And what Crossings does is that one of their mottos is we do little things with great love. And they just help them to resettle and to become independent. They ministered to over 100 people from 20 different countries. And some of those people groups are people groups that have never been reached. Nobody knows a single person in that people group who has come to know Jesus. Listen, if you want to be a missionary to the world and you don't want to get on a plane, you can do it right here. And if you want to be a part of that, you can go to our Next Steps area and just ask them, how do I get involved with crossings? And they can tell you. Listen, we want to give $30 million. That's not all we're going to do. But we feel like that's quantifiable. We know that we feel like God's going to raise up people from our congregation to be missionaries. 
some of our children. We want to be missionaries to Northeast Ohio and to be part of the church planting effort of Orchard NEL. I feel like other of our children might become trainers of indigenous pastors. Others might be pioneers to unreached people. So we feel like it's our time to do something great, something wonderful for God because we feel like for such a time as this, everyone, 10,000 people within a 10-mile radius so that everyone would have a Jesus-following friend. Every community, 60 churches in 30 years right here in Northeast Ohio. And then everywhere, $30 million over the next 30 years for global missions. It'd be so much easier if we just were going to be one, uh, one of those kinds of churches, if we were just a missions church, or if we were just a church planting church, or if we were just a normal, healthy, growing church, it would be so much easier. But what's the fun in that? Right? Robert Browning, a poet, said this, a man's reach should extend his grasp, or what's a heaven for? Right? I was reading a uh, the story of Gideon in Judges 7. And Gideon had an army of 32,000 people and he was about to go to battle and he was still outnumbered four to one. And God, instead of saying, get more people, God said, you need to pare down your army. And so Gideon did to 10,000 people. God said, it's not enough, pare it down more. He got it down to 300 people. And then God said, now you're ready. And the reason God did that is he wanted Gideon to know that he was, that God was the one who was gonna win that victory. And if that's true, I have a question. The question is, then why use Gideon at all? Why didn't God just do it? And the reason is because God loves Gideon. God wanted to invite Gideon right smack dab in the, in the middle of a movement of God so he could feel what it feels like. It had to be absolutely terrifying and absolutely thrilling at the same time. That's what we want. Here at Christ Community Chapel, the next 30 years, would it be wonderful for it to be absolutely terrifying and absolutely thrilling at the same time, to be, to be right smack dab in a movement of God for everyone, every community, everywhere. And at first, it will seem impossible, and then it'll seem simply difficult, and then it'll be done, because that's the way God moves for such a time as this like Esther, to be pulled into something God is doing like Gideon. Let's reimagine everything because of Jesus. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, I'm so grateful that you did not leave us broken. And uh, instead, you decided to go on this amazing rescue operation, sending us your son, Jesus. And I'm also grateful that you didn't just do it all by yourself. Instead, you invite us in to participate with you in this great mission. I pray that uh, you will help us as a church uh, to be like Esther. And even though we may not know exactly what we are doing, we know that for such a time as this, you have put us here. And we want to be like Gideon and be right smack dab in a movement that you only can do as we attempt to reach everyone in every community, everywhere, for your glory and for your sake and for the love of your son, Jesus. And we pray this in his name. Amen.